So good morning, everyone. I'm Adam Povey. I work for the National Centre for Robot Observation, or NCO, based out of the University of Oxford. Uh, I'm today going to be talking about some work I'm doing with respect to a bit of model evaluation, and mostly we'll be trying to just give a few tips and hints about how I get things done, as I apparently use quite a lot of processing on Jasmine in a vaguely efficient way, but have never actually been taught how to do it, so I thought I'd just mention a few of the things that I learned as I went. So, as I said, I'm working on trying to evaluate aerosols within the UK Earth system model using an observational ensemble. And well, what does that mean? Well, the, the image here shows there's a few different ways of measuring aerosols in the atmosphere. And there's then a model which is throwing out a value. And I'm wanting to work out is the model sensible given what we've measured? So, not everyone will necessarily know what are aerosols. Well, they're particulates and droplets that are suspended in the air, basically anything in the air that isn't air. Uh, and common examples are things like volcanic ash or dust. You probably saw in the news those uh, orange mountains of snow early in the week. That was dust being blown over uh, the Alps. Uh, there's also things like smoke coming from fires in California or uh, industrial areas, such as on the right here, the Po Valley in northern Italy. There's a somewhat persistent smog around from the, the heavy industry in the area. Why do we care about these atmospheric aerosols? Well, that's because aerosols both affect climate and our health. If people are familiar with how uh, poor air quality is bad for things like asthma and in the long term shortens life. And from a climate perspective, aerosols can actually affect clouds. They do reflect a certain amount of light directly into space, but clouds are big, white, fluffy things that reflect quite a lot of light and cover about two thirds of the planet at any given moment. And actually a very small change of only a few percent in the albedo of clouds around the planet would actually counteract the entirety of CO2 forcing. Now, we obviously don't physically expect that to happen, but if the aerosols we're releasing are making minor alterations in the clouds, especially their distribution and whatnot, that will have impacts on the climate by changing the distributions of water and heat around and understanding the mechanisms of that is the sort of science I'm trying to do. And the concerns about that are why aerosols are now increasingly being added into climate models. Within the UK, uh, NERC and the Met Office are collaborating to make the UK Earth System Model. An Earth system model, rather than a, a normal climate model, well, normal is possibly the wrong word, but a typical climate model, uh, tries to evaluate more than just the things a weather forecast would do. It brings in uh, land processes, vegetation, and the interactions and chemistry between all of them. Now, none of these plots are actually from the UKSM, they're from a precursor to it, but they're nice pretty things that show you the sort of things the model is doing, of moving carbon through the atmosphere, showing how at different times of year and in different rainy conditions, plants are taking up different amounts of carbon, making different sorts of interactions. It's a very complicated model, but it's uh, having very, very interesting results. And from that aerosol perspective, by explicitly accounting for emissions from vegetation and from dust and land, we can start explicitly accounting for the, the aerosols that are released into the atmosphere and their interactions with the climate more generally. My job is to work out is what they have modeled in this first version of the UKSM actually physically sensible? Is it consistent with the observations that I make in what my normal day-to-day -day job, would, my previous day-to-day -day job would have been? So the sort of assessments that we do of a model are this type of thing. So on the left-hand side, there's a, a model field. Uh, aerosol optical depth for AOD is a number you're going to see a lot uh, through this talk. It's sort of a, a column average of the amount of scattering from aerosol. Numbers of about 0 0.1, 0 0.2 or what you would expect. If you're in sort of China or a massive dust storm, maybe you're getting up to like 0.5 or well up into one on a very bad day. On the left-hand side, we have a, a model field, and then there's a bunch of squares over it. Those are ground detectors. They point up at the sun automatically, measure light at a few different wavelengths, and tell, compare that to what they would expect. It, and that gives an idea as to how much aerosol is in the way. They're a very accurate, reliable uh, measurement that go back 20, 30 years. <clears throat> And the idea of this comparison is we've plotted over, well, these are our ground observations and these are our model. And if we can't see the squares, we're doing a very good job. And you can build numbers to compare that sort of thing. And now uh, we have satellite data records going about 20 years uh, as well. So on the right hand side, we just take a, a monthly mean of our satellite observations, all the, the bin numbers in a particular bin, average them together and 
subtract from the monthly mean we got out of our model. That most common thing that the model throws out. And we, we get a, a plot here and like we could see of, well, it's uh, sort of ready everywhere. So maybe the, the model is slightly overestimating our aerosol over sea, but maybe it's getting the, the, the plume coming off of uh, Africa a bit wrong. These sorts of comparisons are being done for quite some time. I won't go too much of like the, the left hand plot. There are actually good reasons why a point observation shouldn't perfectly compare with a model grid cell, which is averaged over some large area. The same problem also occurs in time of um, uh, an observation is always going to be at a particular instant. Even when you average them up, they're representing instants in time, whereas the model is ostensibly averaging together all of time into a more representative number. And so getting these two things to compare can be quite difficult. So rather than working with these monthly means, I would rather work with something like a histogram or try and actually break down to a very specific point in time or look at very specific circumstances. So I can try and pick apart why the processes might be different. We don't usually get this. Uh, the, one of these plots on the left hand side, can, uh, the, the sort of uh, monthly mean field for a model output can easily be tens, hundreds of megabytes per slice in time. Outputting every hour is a very intense procedure and so takes up a lot of resources. The satellite has the same element. An entire data set is massive. So people usually work with these monthly averages because they're small enough that you can just download them to your laptop and play around with them. But there are lots of different satellite data sets that all give subtly different answers. Jasmine gives me the ability to look at this in a level of detail that's not unprecedented, but is very uncommon. Uh, the CEDA archive has many data sets. There's a catalog uh, at cedar.ac.uk that you can just go and search around at them. Um, I'm the sort of person that knows what I'm looking for, so I just load up LS on some of the folders on Jasmine and have a dig around. It's got a fair fraction of the entire MODIS record going back to 2000. It's got the entire European Space Agency Climate Data Initiative output, various ESA analyses. The work I'm thinking of was sort of based on the realization, well, all the data's lying here. If I'm not in a hurry, I can presumably just open all of these files, move them onto the grid that I want to look at, or just transpose them onto the models grid. And I can do it at whatever resolution I like. I can make histograms of different values. I can do multi-dimensional ones looking at different wavelengths. I could compare to clouds. Or like, there's a lot of data around. And because I don't have to download all of it, it's just there. I have the ability to play around to a great extent. And you couldn't really do this anywhere else other than NASA. And at NASA, my understanding is you have to apply for a specific grant. This works boring and routine enough that, though I hope it will eventually be interesting and make lovely papers, I don't think if I just proposed to do this outright, it would work. It's working for the NCEO that provides the sort of support that's allowing me to do this different way of looking at things. Um, group workspaces, quickly, are also something that's quite handy. Um, there were probably, if you're on Jasmine, familiar with them as a place that you can share data among each other. Two things that I wasn't as aware of previously were, one, if you want to share things more publicly, many of them have the capacity turned on that if there is a folder called public in the workspace, you can just put the files there and anyone can download them. This has been quite useful for me to pass on the outputs of my stuff to people in America who can't log into Jasmine for very understandable reasons, but I don't want to have to transfer everything out and send over to them. And and those FTP spaces have been quite useful for sending things around. And also for anyone specifically that does aerosol cloud type research, um, Matt Christensen formed a group workspace called EO Shared Data, which is massive and has a bunch of aerosol cloud data sets in it. Not always like the entire thing, but there's elements like the CWIFS aerosol product and uh, MISER data are in there, are the sorts of things that aren't as generally useful that Jasmine would have sorted them out themselves. But because there are enough of us, we have this shared space. So if you're interested in trying to see what data there's around, by all means go and apply to join that space. There's a lot of useful things in there. So how do I do my work? Well, I'm an atmospheric scientist, uh, trained as a physicist, so never actually learned how to code. Uh, I, very, uh, I did my thesis in IDL, so Jupyter notebooks suit me wonderfully of, let's code something, run it, oh no, that didn't work, try again. If you've not used a notebook, I would quite recommend it. Uh, that ability to go back to a plot you made for a paper a year ago and just rerun it because the plot is there and the code is there, and provided the data hasn't moved or been deleted, which on Jasmine, it probably hasn't, you can remake things quite easily. So I've not had to load up Photoshop to change a label on a plot in about a year or two since I started using Python because they're all just there. I can easily redo these things.
Now, I only really use this for analysis and playing around. I still use Fortran and C compiled when I'm wanting to do large scale, difficult processing. Uh, but these notebooks I find quite handy. Now, if you want to try a notebook, how might you do that? Well, the easiest way is there is a notebook service on Jasmine. You go to a website, you log in, and you can just use it. It's connected to Jasmine already. It's got all the modules from Jaspi. For most people, as I understand it, that is fine. I do development. I make my own Python modules for the, the retrieval codes I work on. I help on Sys, and I occasionally play around with virus and things. I want, personally, a bit more control over my Python environment. I want to be able to have multiple versions of the same thing lying around that I can play with. And Jasmine doesn't want to do that. So down the right-hand side of the screen, there is a brief summary of how I do things. You can install Conda in your own home directory. They're big enough now that you can fit a moderate amount of environment there. You can't go too silly, but you can fit some. Uh, if you install Jupyter and NVConda, and then set up that you um, you do a pipe forward when you SSH in, I can run a Jupyter notebook on an analysis server and just run it in my browser. It's not ideal in the sense of you are using a shared computer for that, so don't do anything too silly, as I have learned by being an idiot on several occasions, but Jasmine is mostly fine with these sorts of things. and. The notebook service, I played around with it, it works quite well for most stuff. I only use the hard way because I am playing around with my own more intense bits of code and I'm the sort of person that insists that I know what the correct module I want to use is. A few bits of uh, advice I've had of uh, my flatmate is a professional coder and in fact most of my friends are professional coders and when I talk about my day to day problems they somewhat exasperated by it. Uh, two things they've taught me recently that have been quite handy. One object oriented programming is quite useful to put it more sensibly than that. Rather than like uh, the example I have on the left is a common thing for me is I get a file name of some satellite file. We then do some processing and there's then a new name for that file and then I do something else to it and there is a third file. Previously I had to write a bunch of little functions that would translate one file into the other one and back and forth and there are lots of different functions and it was quite messy to read. By making an object that does this instead of I can make a thing called file name, when I create it, I pass it a file name, it works out which sort of name it is, splits it into bits, and then when I want any of the possible outputs I just go file name dot original, file name dot processed, file name dot final. It's easier to read. It's also within Python easier to change of if an ESA goes and changes their file name format or something like that, rather than have to rewrite all of my routines and have two different versions of the code, one for the old stuff and one for the new, I can just make a, I can just splinter off of, or the official name inherit, the original class that I did and just change the one bit of it that has changed, which is that little box in the bottom left. I mean, you don't have to do this, but I have found life is getting easier now that I, rather than think about how do I write a function to do my problem, how can I write an object? Because you sort of just wrap everything you want into the object, and if you need to do something outside of it, well, that's now a function. You know? And I found it, I'm not entirely there yet, but it is a useful way of thinking of things. The other one is, um, write, my flatmate very strongly encouraged me to write tests for my code before I actually wrote it. And this was a bit weird with my histograms. The first question was like, well, I'm going to make this giant histogram with a bunch of points in it. How would I know it was right? Well, I know there were 100 data points in the satellite file. Does the output have 100 points in it? I can just average it all up. And so the things on the right are a brief example of making a little class that the first bit is just open up the, the data and stick it in memory so that whenever I call the thing, I'm not wasting my time and always opening it again. I just do it the first time I need it. And then the rightmost column are then some examples of, OK, I take my histogram, I average all the points together. I then take my data and I average all the points together. All the numbers are the same. And the reason for doing it this way was both, it meant that in my mind, I was thinking about what am I actually trying to make and ensuring that it's the right sort of shape and the properties working, seeing some problems that might come before I encountered them because I realized, oh wait, the dimensions of those things are going to be different. How would I get that? And helping. And also when I got around to writing the code itself, I'd actually written bits of it, like the stuff to read in the original files was already there because I'd done it when I was writing the tests and it just tidied things up a bit. So rather than having like, well, here's how I read the stuff in and here's how I process it and here's how I output it, I'd actually done a lot of that already. And again, it's, it's not amazing, it's not perfect, but it has helped me think about my code in a better way. 
Now, once I had all my code, what did I do with it? I sent it to Lotus and ran it many, 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 many times. I think most people that have used Lotus will be familiar with it. Here is an example of the sort of script I do. The point I want to aim at is array jobs. As far as I can tell, most people that use it will write some script that does, uh, you give it some arguments and it runs something once. You then just loop over it a bunch of times and queue up every single instance. You don't have to. Here's a case where I've written a, a script and you'll see somewhere in the middle, ref is equal to 1995, blah, 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 plus slurm array task ID. When you set up the job, if basically you tell it array and a range of numbers, it will call the script each time for each number in the set. If you don't want contiguous numbers, you can use commas and you could go one, comma, three, comma, five, that type of thing. I then write in here, well, for me, the numbers are dates after 1995. And uh, this will now process those, and now it queues up just the things I want to run. And so I don't have, um, and the advantage of this is rather than having 4,000 jobs in the queue, I have one. And it's easier for the outputs are going to each be numbered, so, uh, because I've put, if you look at the top right, there's this little percent sign A. So the log outputs that come all have a number on them. So when every 500th job fails, I can go and look up, oh, this one failed, oh, because of that. You don't have to do it, but it's a tidy way. It makes it easier to debug things later. Um, just to finish off with a bit of, so I made all the histograms. What did they tell me? So uh, on the left-hand side, this blue line is the output of the model uh, for the number I'm interested in between 1995 and two, uh, 2015. And then the colored lines are the various satellite data sets. The two bits being the models in the middle of them all. Excellent. The model is sort of reason uh, reasonable in that sense. And also an interesting one of the different lines all represent different data sets. They're all different for file formats. And if you look at the individual files, they're quite different. But if we actually add them together, we get extremely similar and correlated lines. And whereas we've been a bit concerned in the community that all of our, our algorithms are doing different things and whatnot, actually on aggregate, it sort of looks like it's just a bias. There's just an offset between the different algorithms. There are certain failings of certain things flag up, but for the most part, it seems fine. And then the bottom left are a different way of the histogram of uh, along the x-axis is the value of optical depth and y-axis is frequency. And you can see that some of the lines are very similar to each other and some of them aren't. And if I, and without telling you which line is the model, you can't really tell. It falls in among the satellite data sets just as anything else. And so from a top level line, the model is doing a fairly reasonable job. It looks not entirely unlike a data set. And so they seem to be going in a sensible direction. It's now just a matter of using these uh, metrics I've made to start with, using these histograms I've made to make metrics that we can then use to evaluate future model versions against the current one to decide not only, well, is this sensible, but is this better than the one we had before? So thank you all for listening. I'm quite happy to take some questions.